morning. I understand we have some birthdays this week, so send in if there's some right ahead. Good morning, everyone, on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's so good to see everybody, and I love everyone. So the first birthday is Jeff Harrison, Kevin Butcher, and myself. I'm having a birthday. <laughs> It's time for our Kids Power offering, and I see they're ready to go. Thank you, Lord, again for all your many blessings. Please bless this Kids Power offering. Help us, Lord, to, to be obedient to your voice as we give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. If you will, get your hymn book and turn to page 662, please. 662. Oh, in my life work. 
work is ended and I cross the swelling tide when the bright and glorious morning I shall see I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be first to welcome me I shall know him I shall know him and redeem by his side I shall stand I shall know him I shall know When I view his blessed face and the luster of his kindly beaming eye, how my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepare for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side. I shall stand, I shall know him, I shall know him by the prints of the nails in his hand. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come, and our parting at the river I Savior, first of all, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side, I shall stand, I shall know him, I shall know Savior, first of all, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side, I shall stand, I shall know him, I shall know him, by the Page 600.
We're glad you're here this morning. We just trust that you'll uh, be obedient to the Spirit. It's so good to have so many on this side today. That's good. So glad everybody's here today. Let's just be obedient. these days, maybe we'll start working on that end section. Do you have any special requests this morning before we go to prayer? Sister Denise would like to be anointed for a friend of hers who is having surgery. So if you come on up, Sister Denise. And you ladies come gather around her. Let's go to prayer.
come to you now for the morning tithes and offerings. Marvin, if you can talk to Brother Vance, I'm sure he would appreciate it. Thank you again, Lord, for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for the privilege of knowing that you are here and I'm not. I'd ask, Lord, that you have your perfect will and make your presence known in whatever way you see. Please bless this offering. Watch the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Someone else is a testimony.
Amen. Come on out. All right, so praise for this final song. Maybe so. All right. We'll see. So good morning. So God is good, and I am nervous, and that doesn't happen very often. So just pray. Um, this is where it's going this morning, and I know that he has a plan.
Praise the Lord. Give him praise, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord deserves praise, don't he, folks? He deserves praise and glory, don't he, folks? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. He deserves praise, folks. He deserves praise and glory, all of our praise. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God been good to you, folks. So good, so good. He deserves all of our praise and all of our glory, all of our focus. He deserves our best, don't he? Praise the Lord. Give him glory this morning. Give him praise and glory this morning. I'm so glad that God makes things new. That God takes old broken things, old worn out things, and he makes them new. He's certainly done that in my life. And I can about bet that he's done that in most of y'all's life. He's taken something old and broken, I don't know what it may be, what, it, what it's been, but he's taken that in your life and he's turned it around, and he's, he's restored it in your life. Our God is the God of restoration. I've, liked, I've restored old houses in, in my past and, and have remodeled, but nothing compares to the restoration that God can make in a life. He can take someone that's destined and, and on a path for hell, Someone that's turned their back completely on God. Someone that's just went astray. And he can take that individual and he can restore their life. He can put a love back in their heart. He can write their name in the book of life and give them a new home and a new name. That's our God, a God of restoration. So whatever you've went through or whatever maybe you're going through this morning, just hold on. Because God will restore. Don't give up. Because God is the God of restoration. You keep seeking Him and He will restore, I promise. That God is the God of restoration. I want to do something I've never done before in my time in ministry. I don't think I have. I know that I've never preached from this. I don't even know if I've taught from this. But would you turn with me to the book of Ruth? And sometimes you just, I don't know why, I've never, I mean, I've read it, but sometimes something just pop out to you. And uh, it's so amazing. The book of Ruth is, is a really remarkable story of a God, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you tonight, so tonight I'm going to preach the first part of Ruth, and ten, or to, to this morning, and tonight I'm actually going to... God just points so much out, and, and Ruth, Lord willing, if it be His will, I'm going to finish the book of Ruth tonight. But I, you see the book of Ruth, and, and it's, it's a love story. If, you like, uh, if you're one of those romantic show type people, and, and you like to watch that stuff, I don't, but uh, some do. This is a good book, a good story for you, because you're not going to find a story better than this. In Hollywood, this is a story above stories. 
But it's more than just a romantic story. It's more than just a love story between Ruth and, and, and Boaz or between Ruth and Naomi. But it's a picture of our God that is a God of restoration, that is a God of redemption. <laughs> We serve a God that restores, that makes all things new. And someday, all things will be completely new. When we live in, in the new heaven, in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem, all things will be made, will be finalized in the remodel. All sin will be, will be sent away forever. Aren't you glad that there won't be any more sin? There won't be the curse of sin. There won't be temptation. There won't be sickness. There won't be death. There won't be parting with loved ones. There won't be hardships. There won't be money problems. There won't be any of this bad stuff that someday God will make all things finally new. I'm looking forward to that time because I don't know about you, but sometimes this world is a depressing place to live. Oh, but we hold on. We stay true, God will make all things new. But God is a God of restoration. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited about this story. I get excited sometimes. I see I get blessed before anybody else does. Uh, because when God just points out something, it just hits home and, and, and you just start, you almost start running circles while you're reading and while you're studying. And you see the orchestration of God, and you see the amazing sovereignty of God. Would you turn with me there to the first chapter, if you probably already are. If you haven't found it by now, then uh, I'm not sure. It's toward the beginning, right after Judges. Turn with me to the first chapter of Ruth, verses 16 and 17. Now, it was hard to find a couple of verses that would sum up in just a couple of verses without reading it all. And I didn't want to necessarily read it all. I would encourage you to read this. It's not, it doesn't take very long to read these four short, four short chapters. That was a tongue twister. It doesn't take that long. I'd encourage you to read it. It's a great story. But would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Chapter 1, Ruth, verses 16 and 17. This is probably the most famous two verses in Ruth, what people quote. Actually, beyond here, I told you I stand. I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, verse 16 says this, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. Now this is Ruth talking to Naomi. Whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also if aught, but death part thee and me. Pray with me, dear Lord Jesus, uh, as we dig into your word this morning. We pray for clarity, I pray for your anointing, God. Oh, we give you glory. We give you praise, O oh Lord, for you are worthy of our praise, God. We're so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you are the God of restoration. You restore old things. You make old things new, God. Uh, you restore old relationships, Lord Jesus. Uh, Lord, you restore, restore old relationships with you. And uh, maybe at one time, uh, Lord Jesus, we had a thriving relationship with you. Oh, but we're in a place, God, uh, uh, of a desert, uh, of a dry time in our life. Uh, Lord, and we just need a touch from you. Uh, Lord, we need you to restore us, God. Add your blessing to your word. Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated, thank you. This was actually the scripture, one of the scriptures, we had a lot of scriptures, that was read at our wedding. And uh, it, even though it is Ruth saying this to her mother-in-law, it's, it's a great illustration of loyalty. Where you go, I'll go. Where you... Sleep, I'll sleep. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Isn't that the perfect picture of unity? Uh, uh, of, of a relationship that works? 
Where you die, I will die. Well, we start out here in the book of Ruth. And there's a famine going on in Israel, and specifically in Bethlehem. They're in Bethlehem, Judah. There's a, there's a famine going on. What this tells you is that, first of all, the nation of Israel was not in a right place. Because God promised that, promised, as long as you serve me, you'll be taken care of. Well, famine was brought on. There was a drought. And um, God specifically promised there would always be plenty in the land. See, I believe Israel was a blessed people. God was their God. Amen? They lived in what we'd call a theocracy. They didn't live in a, a, it wasn't a republic, it wasn't a democracy, it wasn't a monarchy. It was a theocracy where God was their leader. Now God appointed other people, but God was in charge. Wow, could you imagine that? What a blessed people they would have been. Could you imagine a God, a nation whose God is the Lord? Help us, Lord. But we truly live, I believe we live in a blessed place, don't we? We live in a blessed nation. God has blessed us richly. God has blessed other places. But I believe God has blessed us richly. Our country and leaders have made vows to follow the Lord. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be a Christian. That doesn't even mean all of our founders were Christians. No, that does not mean that. But it's engraved deep in our Constitution. It's engraved in the Declaration of Independence. We are going to be a Christian nation. We're going to reflect the principles of God. A nation... A, 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 a nation whose God is the Lord is a blessed nation, the scriptures tell us. We've been a blessed nation. But folks, the blessings won't last forever. Folks, don't think for a second that God isn't able to pull His hand of blessing, is He? Oh, but I think maybe God might be up to something. I think I, I see revivals happening. I see God moving all over, not just in our country, not just around here, but in other countries all over the world. God is moving, isn't he, folks? God is moving. It's what we've been praying for. It's what we've been seeking for, a move of the Holy Spirit. God moves through humility. God moves. But just like We see God could take a blessing away in a heartbeat from the nation of Israel. God could certainly do that with anywhere, anybody, any nation he pleases. And don't think that we are exempt from that. Because when we start to think that we're exempt from losing God's blessings, and if we don't realize that God has blessed us, then we need to check. Look around the world. Look at other systems of government. Look at other leaders. Look at these, these horrible, some of these horrible dictators and all this that goes on. God has surely blessed us. But let us never forget that we're not exempt from the hand of blessing being removed. Well, times get hard in Israel. There's a famine. Right, as we said this morning, that they were dependent on rain. You know, they didn't have all the, the, the systems that we have in a desertous region. They were dependent on rain. And, and if rain didn't happen, crops didn't grow. If crops didn't grow, then there would be a shortage of food. If there was a shortage of food, people would get hungry. And when people get hungry, they get desperate, don't they? And sometimes when people get desperate, they make rash decisions. They don't think, and they make bad decisions. But folks, even in the bad times, I'm going to get to more. May we trust in God. But there was a famine in Israel. So uh, a guy by the name of uh, Elimelech travels. He sojourns, and he had intentions on returning. But he said his idea is, while this famine is going on, I'm going to leave the place where God wants me to be, and I'm going to go up into the pagan nation of Moab and, and, and seek shelter there and try to make a living there. See, folks, 
He was running, at the time, he was running from God. And so he, and he, not only is he running, but he took his wife and his two sons with him. See, we have a choice when bad times come. Bad times will come. Hard times will come. Whether it's our fault or whether it's not our fault, hard times are bound to come in life. And when hard time, times come, we have a choice. We can be disobedient to God. We can run from our problems. Or we can face them and, and, and repent, face life. Or even turn from God when times get hard. We can blame God. We have to ask ourselves, how have we handled hard situations? Because how we face tough situations speaks a lot of character, doesn't it? Do we have a character after God? How do we handle hard times? Do we turn to God or do we turn from God. Now, many people will turn to God in the bad times, but then not turn to Him in the good times. So there's an opposite, right? But at all times, may we seek God. Amen? At all times, in the good and the bad, in the hard times, in the prosperous times, in every season of life, whether we're on the mountain or whether we're down low in the valley without nothing, may we seek the living God. Amen? And believe in his provision. Believe that he will not leave nor forsake his people. Mm. So they set way, set a path for Moab. <laughs> but when Elimelech and his family, when they come to Moab, they would soon face more tragedy. Mm. It's bad, they flee. Well, Elimelech soon dies, soon passes away, leaving Naomi alone with her two sons. I don't know how old her boys were. I don't know if they were young. It doesn't really say. I suppose you might be able to do some kind of math to try to figure it out. I don't know. But it makes it sound like it was a desperate situation. It kind of makes it sound like that the two boys were not quite old enough to prepare to provide for themselves. And so widows at the time were dependent on the generosity of strangers, but they weren't in Judah. They weren't in, they weren't in Israel. They weren't in Bethlehem. They were in a foreign land. Didn't know anybody. And so here is the story. Elimelech dying might not be a necessary Ne uh, necessarily a direct punishment from God, although it could be. But, but sometimes in life, what we got to know, sometimes life brings tragedies. Sometimes life brings tragedies. Where do we turn in tragedies? Uh, and the life in Moab wasn't easier as they'd find out. See, many people try to outrun God and move away from their problems. It happens a lot. Whether we move or whatever it is, we try, well, but problems will always have a way of catching up with you. That's just good practical common sense there. If we don't deal with issues, if we don't deal with problems, they will always come back somehow, some form. We can't run away. You know, someone once said, I've heard this before, you can move all over the world. There's something that will always follow you. Debt. It's true. It'll follow you wherever you go. You can't run from debt. Sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes we got it under control. But problems will not leave. We can run. Uh, problems will follow you. The same problems, maybe it's just a different place, but problems need dealt with. Because undealt with problems will cause stress. They'll, they'll bound you down. Problems will haunt you. Things in your life, if, if situations aren't dealt with, They'll haunt you. And Elimelech was trying to run from his problems. And it caught up with him, didn't it? And the problems continue. Well, verses 4 and 5 in Ruth 1, that you see the two sons. Uh, um, 
Mo, uh, no, I done forgot Moklan, Moklan, and, and Kilion. Their two sons end up marrying two Moabite women. Okay? So I don't know how much time goes by. It doesn't say. Ruth marries, Ruth marries uh, Mo, Mo, <laughs> Moklan and Orpah marries, Achilleon marries this woman named Orpah. What a name. I see that and it kind of reminds me of Oprah. I don't know. That's what I kept wanting to say as I was reading this, Oprah. <laughs> well, right here is a disobedience from God or disobedience of God. Because God commanded the Israelites not to marry pagan nations surrounding them. I mean, we don't have to look very far. We mentioned this a little bit this morning in Sunday school, but there was a guy by the name of, uh, of King Solomon. And he definitely had a woman problem, didn't he? He had a woman problem. He had a thousand some, odd, some women between marriage and concubines. And what he would do, he would marry pagan women, right? And they would turn his heart from God. See, God says, don't do this. Don't unequally yoke yourself with unbelievers. That's the practical practicality beside it. Don't give your heart uh, to an unbeliever because they're not going to have the same wants and desires as you are. Amen? Now, that isn't saying we should not be friends with lost and all. Yes, we should. And, be, and, and reach out and love people. But who we spend all of our time with will depict many times on how we go. Who we share everything with. What we share all of our secrets with. Who we, who we turn to for advice. Who we marry. God wants that to be equally yoked. So there was a problem here. Now we're just setting the stage, alright? Now these Moabite women's, they, they, their names, and, and so I don't know how their, their names got a biblical meaning. I don't, maybe they were given these names. But Orpah simply means the back of the neck, stick, stiff neck. Or stubborn. And this, this will mean something in a little bit. Ruth, pronounced ra, uh, associates with, with a friend. So she was a friend. But it will be interesting how here in a little bit how these names play out and how they mean something. Well, we, we've come to the story so far. We know what's happened. They've run, for, they've run from God and their problems to a pagan nation. The father dies, leaving their two sons. Well, their two sons end up getting married, marrying Moabite pagan women. And now, the story even gets worse. The two sons both die. The two sons, Naomi's sons, both die. Now, John mentioned this a little bit ago in his prayer request. It doesn't matter how old you are, that's the news that all parents would dread and be distraught to hear. That your two, your only, your two sons pass away. And I don't know exactly, it doesn't go into detail, but I can imagine how distraught Naomi is at this time. And Ruth and Orpah, are, they just lost their husbands. There's three widows now, all together. Living together. Naomi is in a foreign land all by herself. She is down. I could imagine, see, everybody's low, lowest point is different. I've been in a low spots in my life. And some have been in some low spots in their life. But I could imagine this is probably the lowest of the low for Naomi. Think about it. She's down at the very bottom. She has lost everything. She is, has, is in the process at the time she has been part of the running from God in a foreign nation and she's down at the bottom but aren't you glad that something changes something changes uh, see a childless widow was at the bottom of the totem pole of society depending financially as I said on strangers many times Widows would turn to prostitution as a means to survive. 
And I don't know how old Naomi was at this time. I don't know. But I, I could imagine that could have been a temptation of her. But she had better character than that. Their situation was desperate. They were at the bottom. Have you ever been in a desperate situation? Have you been worn down by life? Have you been beaten down by life? Has it caused you to, to lose faith in God? Has situations in your life turned you from God? And you've gotten far away from God, let me tell you this morning. God is a God of restoration. Well, the story picks up and we see Naomi and her two daughters start to head back for Judah. You can look in verse 6 and 7. They heard, they heard good things were happening back home. And, and I can imagine they would say, what else have we got to lose? I can imagine Naomi thinking, now that wasn't a, a short trip necessarily. But they had to head back for Judah. Revival had broken loose in Judah. People were seeking God again. And they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. See, our life with God should make others want to come back to the Lord. Amen? People should see just how uh, excited we are about the things of God and say, man, I want some of that excitement. I want some of that love. I want some of that mercy. Genuine and true. When revival breaks loose, wanderers will come back to God. Naomi could have stayed in Moab. She could have wished things were different. I'm sure she did. She wanted things to be different. She could have stayed there and she could have wished things were different, waiting to receive something good from God. But instead, unlike many others, she set out to receive what God had for her. See, she just, she had some complaints. She said, God, what, you're after me, your hand's against me. But she didn't sit and do nothing. She did something about her state, right? God will provide for us. God will take care of every need, but we can't just do nothing sometimes. Paul says that those that aren't willing to work won't eat. Paul says that. And I have to think, God will help us. God will take care of us, but sometimes there is a little bit of action on our part. And God gives us direction and God provides for us, makes provisions. We can't sit and just wish things were different. <clears throat> so here we go. They're back on their way to Judah. They've set the course back for Judah. Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. On the return, Naomi petitions and pleads with her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab and stay. So this is an interesting thing. You would think, why would she want that? Would she not want the company? This just tells you that Naomi, in her change of heart, looked out for them. She loved her daughters-in-law. She loved them. She, she wanted the best for them, and she knew that the best for them, financially speaking, would be for them to go back to where they're most familiar with, they could probably find another husband more easily that would take care of them. They would be probably more financially fit. But sometimes the things that, don't make, the, that make the most sense aren't what God has for us. Amen? Sometimes we wonder why in the world God does the things that He does in the way that He does it. But if we follow the Lord, we'll never go wrong. Amen? Follow the Lord, we will never go wrong. It makes sense that they would go back. We see them, there's a strong bond that's formed. It's a, they wept. Naomi says, you need to go back. And here they are, can you imagine this, uh, these three women having their emotional time together. And they're crying together. And this is... And they don't want to leave Naomi. They've, they've formed this bond and they've learned uh, to love her. And not only just like a mother-in-law, but they've loved her like a mother. They formed this bond. See, Naomi had in her mind that the, the hand, of Lord, hand of the Lord was against her. When, when tragedy strikes, it's easy to blame God. But it is in tragedy and despair 
that God shows his power. And God was showing his power here. God would surely show his power and providence in her life, in the life of Naomi. But here's the key. Here's the key. Yes, Naomi thought and said that the hand of the Lord is against me. God's against me. But she recognizes something that a lot of don't recognize. A lot of people don't recognize. I need to return back to God. The God might have been against her, yes, because of their, their um, rebellion, the move away from where God had them to live, that God wanted them to be there in, in, in Judah, in Bethlehem. And no, but she said that she was saying that she needed to go back. No, Naomi recognized the situation. But the, the, circum, the, the key is, whether it's punishment or whether it was circumstance, the key is to seek God, to draw close to Him. Listen, we must draw close to Him in all circumstances, not further ourselves away from God, but draw close to Him. We'll hear in the next few verses, verses 14 and 18, we see that Orpah returns to Moab, but Ruth clings to Naomi. Both girls love, love Naomi. Both of them loved her. They showed her love for her. A motherly daughter love that they had for each other. But still a choice had to be made. But Ruth showed action. See, there comes, an, a, a, there, there comes a place in following God, a time in following God, where love's got to be put into action. We can love God, or we can love the, the feelings we get, and we can even say we love people. But faith is more than just uh, mere words, isn't it? We can say, say, say all we want. But sometimes love has to be put into action. See, John 3.16, John 3, Jesus, it said, For God so loved the world, well, I'm glad it just didn't stop there. Yeah, God loved the world, but what did he do about it? He acted. For God so the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, love was put in the action. And so now Ruth, her statement of faith was put into action. She said, yes, Naomi, Naomi, yes mother-in-law, Naomi. I don't know why I get that, keep getting that tongue-tied. Naomi, I love you. I do. I love you like a mother. And I'm going to show you because I'm going to follow you. See, we can say we love God all we want. But unless we're willing to follow him and follow his ways, our words mean nothing. Our intentions mean nothing. We can have good intentions to follow God. We can have and do have good intentions to, to do the things that God calls us to do. But until we do them, the words mean nothing. Amen? A promise, an agreement is nothing unless, it, unless it's held. Right? We can promise something. We can make deals. We can make promises, agreements. We can make business decisions. But unless uh, that agreement is held and put into action, the words mean nothing. We see we live in a time now where, where the promises and, and, and being a man of your word isn't as important as it used to be. We do. You used to be able to make agreements or, or through handshakes. Can't do that anymore. Because words mean nothing unless action is involved. Ruth's faith and love for Naomi and for God was put into action. And even better, yes, Ruth loved Naomi, but even more than that, we see a picture through Naomi that Ruth chose to follow God. Now listen, Ruth was a Moabite. She was not, she was not an Israelite. She, she didn't believe in the one true God. But Moabites believed in false gods pagan gods, but Ruth chose 
to follow God. Isn't that good news, folks? See, we have a choice in our life. Are we going to follow God or are we going to turn back? She could have turned back. Her sister did or whoever she, Orpah, whether it was her sister or I don't know. She, she, loved, she loved Naomi, but she didn't want to follow through with it. She turned back and started seeking her other gods. And you know tradition has it. Now this is, I don't know, I've read some about this. They said that, that uh, you know, long story short, we know that Jesus is in the lineage of Ruth. Therefore, David, King David, was a, a great, great or grandson, great grandson. Anyways, I got on there. Anyways, of King David, right? Obed, Jesse, and then David. Anyways, but they say that Orpah, was in the lineage of Goliath. Now, if that is exactly 100% true, I don't know. But it's interesting, to th- it's interesting to think about that our decisions have future impacts, don't they? Now, whether that is right or not, we can see that it's saying whatever it is, she chose to not follow the one true God. See, we have a choice, and our choices right now have a lot of future implications. We can choose right now, in this situation, whatever we're going through, whatever valley we're in, whatever hardship, whatever hard time we may be in, if we're far from God, we can choose right now what we're going to do with it. Are we going to turn back to God, or are we going to turn away from God? In our decisions right now, will have a lot of future implications. It could be future, what it can mean for the, the future of our family, the future, uh, 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 my future, what I do. She had a choice, Ruth did, and she turned to God. Oh, and Naomi took her under her wing, nurtured her in the ways of God. See, people should be able to see you and say, I want your God to be my God. People, we nurture people and we, we look, whoever we come in contact with, we, we witness to people. People would, would, would want to say, could you imagine, oh, I don't know what God you're serving. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what church you're going to, but I want to be a part of it. Now, ain't, never, ain't everybody going to be like that. That's just the way it is. But I, I'm still a believer that God can get through to anybody. Amen. I'm a believer till I die that God can get through to anybody. But it's a relationship with Jesus that will sustain for us in the New Testament. Mere feelings will not sustain. We're emotional beings. We have ups and downs. We're not always going to be happy. There's going to be times when we're sad. There's going to be times when we're angry. Emotions won't sustain, but a relationship with Jesus Christ will sustain. Mm. See, not only did Ruth have an amazing relationship with Naomi, but she developed one with God. And I could just imagine on that long journey, it doesn't say it, I like to read between the lines. Not too much to where it takes it out of context, but this is totally within context. I can imagine this long journey back. And Naomi is just explaining the things of God to Ruth, nurturing her, developing this relationship even stronger. Mm. This Gentile woman, once far from God, had drawn near to him. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad we can draw near to God? (laughs) Aren't you glad that there's nothing... I mean. We don't have to come to a person to draw near to God. You don't have to come to me, thank goodness. You don't have to go to somebody else. But you can draw near to God right where you are, each and every one of us. We can draw near to God. And I'm so glad that God reveals himself uh, uh, to sinners. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, or what you've done. You can draw near to God. That's the good news. You can draw near to God, and He can restore you. 
Well, the story picks up there in verse 19 in Ruth chapter 1, and they finally get to Bethlehem. After this long journey home, but the thing is, no, <coughs> Naomi returned in humility. She didn't act like everything was great. She said, you know, the, don't, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me this other, because God is against me. And her attitude here is, no, it's not a negative attitude of God being mean and against me and, and hating me. No, her, the attitude here is, I have done wrong. And God is against me. God deserves to be against me. I deserve God's wrath because I've run from God. See, Naomi comes back in humility. She didn't act like everything was perfect. She had wandered away from God. But in her wandering, God had a plan to make things right. God had a plan to restore her. God had a plan to get her back to where she was. See, Naomi grew up a we could call her, grew up a Christian kid. Let's we'll just say that. She wanted from God. Oh, but God still had a plan for her. I'm, th I'm thankful that God has a plan for wandering Christian kids. Folks, I was a wandering Christian kid. Oh, but God has a plan. God has a plan for each and every life. And, and it doesn't matter how far you wander. God's infinite. God's infinitely big. You can't run from God far enough where he can't just take you and grab you and pull you back. Amen? But God is a God of restoration. He wants to restore what was broken. First and foremost, he wants to restore the relationship that maybe you once had with him. He wants to restore that. Bring you back. Oh, Naomi is back home. God led her back and she went. She went. Listen, this morning, as I get close to the end here, once again, we serve a God of restoration. No matter what, how far we've ran from God, no matter what circumstance we're in, Folks, the good news is we can return to God, and He welcomes us back with open arms. He welcomes back His people with open arms. He says, come to me, all you are weary, heavy, burdened, and I'll give you rest. A look at the story, we skip to the New Testament in Luke uh, chapter 15, and we see the story of the prodigal son. I want to read you a few scriptures, skip through a few scriptures and read you the story about the prodigal son. Starting in verse 20, it said, He got up and came to his father. Remember the prodigal son had, had gone away, had gone astray, had, had spent his an entire inheritance on who knows what. Gambling and women, I don't know. Had spent it all, had blown all of his money, had just ruined, completely ruined his life. He needed restored. The prodigal son knew where to go. He had to go up and go. He had to make a decision to, to, to do something about it. To get up, and, but he knew who to return to. To return to the father. He got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. See, the, the prodigal son was stating something very accurate. We're not worthy. We're not worthy to be called a son. We're not worthy to be called a, a daughter of the king or a son of the king. But I'm glad that, that it doesn't matter if we're worthy. But God says, I love you anyways. For this son of mine, he says, in spite of what the son had done, he returned to the father in forgiveness and humility. And the father said, he said, 
For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they begin to celebrate. Amen. The Bible says that when one sinner repents, there's a party in heaven. Amen. All the angels rejoice. And I'll tell you at this time that, when, that all the angels were rejoicing in heaven when the prodigal son came home. The moment you got saved, there was a party going on in heaven. Can you, can you imagine? All the billions of people. But God celebrates over one lost sinner, just as the parable of the sheep talks about. One lost sinner, one lost sheep that comes home. God forsakes the 99 for that one. Because each and every one of you, each and every one of us is special to God. Is special to God. It doesn't matter if we're worthy or none of us are worthy. But God says, I don't, it doesn't matter. I love you. Verse 32 in Luke 15. But he had to celebrate, but we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and begun to live and was lost and has been found. Aren't you glad that lo the lost can be found? Aren't you glad that the dead can be, can be brought to life? As Ezekiel prophesied about the dead bones coming to life. Uh, aren't you glad that God can bring up dead bones uh, and He can make an army out of dead bones? Uh, that God can rise up what is broken and He can restore it. And God can restore something in your life. God is the God of restoration. God will clean up the mess. God will restore and mend what's broken. God will restore what, what is lost. Maybe we've lost something. Or maybe we've experienced loss in our life. God is a God of restoration. Naomi and Ruth lost everything. Naomi and Ruth lost all their provisions. They lost it all. They were down at the bottom. Can you imagine Oh, but God in his love called Naomi back and said, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to make a future. I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to give you a hope. I'm going to make something out of your name. Oh, didn't he make something out of her name? He made something out of that name. In fact, the, the Savior would come through that obedience, would come through that lineage because of the obedience. God wants our entire mess, not just part of it. It's not a burden for Him. See, a burdens weigh us down, don't they? But God doesn't, there's no limit to God's strength. God is strong. He can carry all the burdens. He can take them all. So, there's a story about pallets. If you work around... Uh, and if you work around, many of you work around, you know I'm talking about pallets, right? Wooden pallets. This is, this is interesting, I know. But pallets have a shelf life. When they're, when they're thrown around, they, they, they put heavy things are put on pallets, they bust. And they break. And they need to be thrown out. And then really a pallet, once it's thrown out, once it's not, it's not good for anything. And so it'll be then sold to, to some company that'll either mulch it up or, or burn it or even take it out to a land. So you actually have to pay to get rid of an old pallet sometimes. But there's a company I was reading about. A lot of people do this. See, pallets are actually made with hardwood, with actually valuable wood, hard oak and some other different, sometimes um, walnut and, and, and some other different kinds of hardwood. See, we can, people will take that old, those old broken pallets and, yeah, they can make mulch out of them or make, make some, uh, what, that out of them and, and, um, and they'll be worth just a little bit, maybe $30 a ton. But you know what? You can also, people, there's been companies that will take those old pallets and make flooring out of them. So now those old pallets are worth uh, $1,200 a ton. But even more than that, some people will take those old pallets and will make really nice furniture out of them. When furniture is made out of old broken pallets, they're worth about 6000 a ton. I'm saying this, that God can take the old broken things 
that we think that are no good. God can take them and turn that into something that is extremely valuable. Amen? God can take those old things in your life and turn around for His good. The Bible says all things happen for the good of those who love God and the ones called according to His purpose. But that good is not necessarily good we might think. The good is to be made into His image. That God can take an image that was broken and marred and He can turn it around and, and make it something new. Would you come, if you will? I want to uh, remind you again. I'm, I've asked them if they, if, if Jim would, would sing a song. God can take a life and make it valuable. Praise the Lord. God wants to restore you. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence again. Lord, I'm so thankful that you're a God of restoration. That you're God that can, can take the old broken and rebellious and, and, and take the sin and take everything and which we've turned from you. and You can turn around somehow, you can fix it, and you can make it new. Whatever we're going through, whatever, whatever we've done, wherever we at, we might not even turn from you. Lord, but we're just a broken right now. Lord, we just need a touch from you. We need to be restored. Oh, we just need your touch this morning, God. Help us, Lord. Restore us, we ask and pray, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. If you have a need this morning, I'd ask you to come. I'd ask you to come and lay, lay the burden down. Would you come this morning? Whatever it is, whatever it is, just give it to the Lord. Just give it to the Lord. And, and what a better, we, you know, we come to altars and, and, and it's a great place to meet God. Because what can happen there is brothers and sisters in Christ can pray with you. Do you have to actually physically come to an actual altar to pray to God? No. 
But it's a place of humility. It's a place where brothers and sisters can pray with you and can, and, and can help strengthen you. So I invite you, if there is anything, I don't know what it is, but if there is anything that you just need to give to God this morning, I don't know what it is, but if there's anything this morning, just give it to Him and let Him restore that in your life.
hearts clear this morning? Has God been good to you? Praise the Lord. Continue to seek Him. Stay true to Him. Come back tonight. I encourage you. If you can, please come back tonight. And um, I'm excited to hear from God again. Yes. Yes, Sheila. Brother Roger, could I ask you to pray for us as we dismiss this morning? All, all hearts clear? Anything else you need to mention?